get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, Einstein Bagels, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. You know, uh, one of the things I love is, you know, interviewing, um, you know, Noah from who started Einstein Bagels. And yeah, it's, it's amazing to hear a story of selling for $100 million to, uh, to a company. But what I love is the story of, how he was selling religious tchotchkes out of his trunk and it failed and all the failed challenges that led up to that success is really what is kind of makes the business and it's behind the scenes what we don't hear so um i this episode is sponsored by rise 25 and rise 25's mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers through a done for you media content solution a done for you lead generation solution and we also do done for you vip events for software companies um, and conference organizers i am very excited to talk to today uh, today's guest we have howard marks he's co-founder of start engine which is the premier equity crowdfunding platform uh, what they do is they connect investors with tomorrow's progressive companies so start engine aims to revolutionize the startup business model by helping individuals invest in private companies on a public platform and what that does is it basically helps entrepreneurs achieve their dreams it helps society because that creates jobs so you can learn more at startengine.com he founded start engine in 2011 to help la based startups grow successfully invested at the time at 60 different startups um, he has founded the rebirth of activision in 1991 with a business partner he founded the rebirthing online game industry howard thanks for joining me thank you happy to be here I want to talk, you know, we're going to talk about Start Engine. I have to ask, what did the gaming industry look like in 1991? In 91, it was an important year for the video game industry because you had Atari that failed and uh, went out of business. Everybody thought the video game industry was dead. And then you had Nintendo who sneaked in in the late 80s with their NES machine. And no one knew whether it would go well or not, but it went well for them, but not for anybody else. They were just selling their machine with some games. And the game industry, the people who were making games, were just failing left and right. And we came in in 91 to basically buy Activision for very, virtually no money, for $300,000, $400,000. We got control of the company. And the reason why it worked was we decided, look, we're not going to focus just on these cartridges that may or may not work and you have inventory issues, you have to pay a lot of money, you have to order them out of Japan, it takes forever to come. We're going to make games on CD-ROM, which were the precursor to the DVD. And people were like, wow, that's great, but no one has one, you know? Right. That's the best time to get in. So if you believe that CD-ROM DVDs will become a lower cost, more flexible, better medium than a cartridge, which is a hardware, low capacity, super expensive medium. Guess what? You you the cartridge you'll pay twenty dollars to manufacture, and this one, the CD maybe fifty cents, maybe a dollar. Okay, a dollar, you know. And we knew that that was it, and that because these these CDs have more capacity, you could be making better games, more enrichment, better content. So we figured, okay, you know what? Let's take Activision over and let's restructure it into a higher, higher quality, higher, more, more gameplay, more imagery, more visuals in a new medium that's more flexible. While you created this rebirth, what were some of the popular games at the time? Well, the game that Activision was known for was Pitfall. A lot of people played that. But then what we focused our time was with two games that really took a big difference for us. It, one was Zork. Zork was this adventure game and we made a CD-ROM version with video for the first time and real actors and the adventure Cutting game. Cutting edge stuff. Off, came to life. Except that the only way you could play this game is you need to buy an accessory for your PC. You know, you imagine what you have these desktops 
you needed an accessory, and most people couldn't even figure out. How to I mean, well, what did it look like at the time? Like floppy disks? Like what were people using? No, at that time, floppy disks. So if you had a game that was pretty popular, you had twenty, fifteen disks came in a box, and and that still was not enough. And anyway, yeah, you're right, floppy disk. So what happened just then when we released Zork, we ended up having the best game for the CD-ROM and those who had one had to buy it because there's nothing else for them to do. And instantly we sold a lot of games. And then the next game that really made a huge difference was a game called Mech Warrior, which is based on a, a board game. It's just big robot mechs. And this game was 3D. Now, today, everybody says, oh, yeah, everything is 3D. Yeah, sure. At that time, it wasn't. It'd be like well, a hologram today, like someone popped yeah, up today, in front of you. Right, yeah. At that time, at 2D, you know, if you had something that was 2D, which means just an image, that's fine. But think in three dimension, moving around, that was rare. So we built that, but we did something unique. Is because when we built the game, it was so slow on a normal machine, you know? Ah, if you bought these new 3D chip cards video cards, new, brand new, just coming out, it would come to light. And you could get incredible visuals, incredible animation. And guess what? Same thing happened here. All the people who were buying the game that didn't have the wanted speed went out and bought the board, the, that graphic chip board, literally put in your machine, or the ones who had it needed to buy the game. And that just took off like a monster. And kind of set the company in the right motion, which is, you know, bleeding edge, quality stuff, fun, and yet use the new technology early on. How and did the, the competitors were not even doing that. Well, it's pretty cutting edge. It's, I'm, it seems risky at the time because you're betting on more technology and it's, you know, a lot for, I mean, I guess the, the user is so passionate, they'll do anything, it seems like. Well, the reason we did it, frankly, is because we had nothing to lose. <sighs> company was already dead mm. you know we took it through bankruptcy there's nothing to lose just take risks mm -hmm. when you're doing well everything's great and someone comes and says hey let's take a risk let's enter this new thing called cryptocurrencies whatever you just get out of here just go <laughs> buy or you know you have a bookstore and someone comes and says hey you know what we could sell our books online let me tell you this I have 30 stores we sell them this way get out of here and that's the reality it's called the innovator's dilemma. It happens every day. Those who understand it can survive it. Most of the time, you don't. How did you get into the gaming industry in general? Well, it was just because we were making software, um, you know, from the University of Michigan, you know, in our house, making software, starting to build a business for the Apple II, and that crashed, and then we tried to do it for another game machine from Commodore and that crashed and we said you know what we're tired of this we want a medium a type of you know industry where we can grow it and and so we picked the video games and we looked well are there any companies we could buy and that's where Activision came in mm. and then next was Acclaim so I left Activision about 10 years later and I was not interested in getting back into the game industry necessarily but, you know, not not a bad idea. So I was reading in the Wall Street Journal that they claim, which was at one point the number one game company. They had Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam. I mean, they were major, major, major. Was getting liquidated. So so I don't know if you're re reading, your, your listeners are probably hearing about Sears, Roebuck, and Target. Should they be saved in bankruptcy? So they're in Chapter 11, which is reorganization. But the Creditors want to throw them to Chapter 7, which is liquidation, because they think there's more value there. So in the case of Activision, we did a, a Chapter 11 and restructured it. But this time, a claim was going in Chapter 7, liquidation, voluntarily, meaning that's it. We want to do it ourselves. I thought it was really strange. I called the trustee of the bankruptcy court and I said, hey, I want a bid to buy and they were like all excited about it and they said okay well what do you want to bid I said a hundred thousand dollars and they like they I think there was a pause <laughs> they were like this is a joke right I said no anyway flash forward a little longer 
they say, okay, we'll start an auction. Do you want to do you want to participate in an auction? I said yes. What's your opening bid? Hundred thousand. Great. Here's your bid. Sign the paperwork. Off we go. Auction happens. There are no other bidders. Wow. So I end up doing the whole thing for a hundred grand, and I'm saying, okay, what do I do? <laughs> It as a online game company. I mean, this is a company that had a multi-billion-dollar market cap. To pay for hundred thousand seems very, very low. Anyway, rebuild it as an online game company with seventeen million players. Then sell it to another company that ends up being bought by Disney. And then I'm here saying, you know what? What do I do now? You know, I'm bored. And so I looked around in L.A and found that there was not really any accelerator, any way to help young startups you know, get started and funded and educated. So I built the first startup accelerator called Start Engine. And initially, you know, just for LA, did a bunch of them. And while I was investing in you know, women, entrepreneurs, and people of color, and all sorts of great stuff, the results were really bad. Hmm. Because they couldn't raise any money, and I'm like, "Well, hold on a second. Why? Like, what's the big deal? Just go raise money here. Let me introduce you to VCs. Let me introduce you to angels. Nothing. Nothing. And so I said, you know what? The system is broken. It's obvious. These are really cool people with great ideas, lots of talent, willing, capable, resilient. Can't get money." System is broken. So that's where my entrepreneur mind came in, and I started, I, and I basically started a division or a new company, Start Engine Crowdfunding, with the idea that there's a new law that just was put in place, and I'm going to take advantage of it. So, yeah, so how tough was it to start the online version, the crowdfunding I, case? It was really easy, frankly. I was shocked. So I told everybody in my team, I said, you know what? We're dumb because we're going to start a crowdfunding platform. There will be 200 of them out there, and we're just going to be one of 200, and it's going to be you know difficult because there's a lot of competition. Anybody can do one. What's a big deal? So that was my prediction that a lot of people will jump in because it's such an obvious one, right? Disrupt the financial industry. Disrupt the VCs. Disrupt everybody. Just raise money from the crowd. First time in 80 years a normal person in this country can invest. I mean, come on, that's a big idea. Well, we launch June of 2015. We get our first customer, it's a car company. They need money, and so they had some fans. We ran through it, raised 17 million for them. It was just crazy wow. for, for from 6,000 people. We were very excited. And guess what? No, there wasn't 200 companies out there. There was maybe three. <laughs> And I realized, you know, even though it's a new law, it's available to anyone, it's there, it's right there, anybody can read it, anybody can implement it, it's just not what people do. Hmm. How'd you get traction on it? Because you look on there, there's a lot of businesses, some cool businesses, there's like a diabetes clinic on there, there's, you know, uh, a Mad Axe, a golf board, there's a couple of cool, how do you start to get traction? Okay, so first customer I mentioned was a car company. Yeah. And the reason we got them is because they went around to the financial wizards and investors all out there and couldn't get the capital they needed. And uh, the CEO was pretty adamant, I'm going to go raise the money so I can build a car. So in many ways, that was a lucky break for us. So that worked. And then we did an airplane, a vertical takeoff airplane concept. And, and then we did MedEx, which was a pesticide for the medical marijuana space, which is a fast-growing space. And each of them actually did well. And then in May of 2016, we launched the million-dollar raises, the smaller ones, and we stumbled. We just were not getting the companies we wanted. We, we couldn't understand. Look, look at all the success we had. Well, it turns out we didn't, we didn't have our marketing together we didn't have the right leads we ended up with some bad luck not not very good that turned around very quickly because then we said you know what let's go and find these entrepreneurs so we created mailing lists uh, ads we went to shows we went to the consumer electronic show we, we did everything we could and it turned around very quickly so 2016 we had maybe 10 companies 
And we were like, this is going to be a long road. <laughs> this is going to be hard. Hey, guys, how hard is it going to be? Really hard. Hey, be ready for 10 years of, of dredge. So then in 2017, we raised money for 80 companies. And that was a big success. And last year, we just finished a year, we raised money for, well, we launched 250 companies and raised money for 150 companies. It was unbelievable. Last year was unbelievable. And this year, I have no idea. We'll see how it goes. So far, the demand is very strong. Shocking, right? Companies need capital. I don't know. That seems so bizarre. <laughs> What's some of the, the companies, Howard, that stick out um, on, the, on the platform? Well, it turns out we feel that the kind of companies we get are really entrepreneurs, CEOs, very usually early stage, either realize they can't get VC money, or if they did, they don't want the terms. They don't like the idea of losing control. They would rather keep control of their company. And then all of them in common love marketing. They love going to people out there and saying, Here's my message. They go to the press. They go on blogs. They're very active. That's the kind of people that do great. Yeah. This is a perfect, actually, I think, interview for the site in general because I'm talking to, to founders, and even though they have customers, they have money, they're looking to raise more, and this is seems like an alternative to the traditional route. Well, until we did it and our competitors, which are not many, there was no alternative because the banks are not going to lend you money unless you have a house you can mortgage. And the VCs only do 2,000 deals a year and the angels maybe 10,000. I mean, it's a disaster. It is an absolute disaster. So, yes, an alternative, yes. And so it's interesting how today you call what we do an alternative. Some people call it fringe. Some people call it garbage. But the truth <laughs> is this. Yeah. The truth is this. In five years from now, crowdfunding is going to be the way people raise money for their company. Period. They're not going to go to the VC. Rarely. They're going to go directly to the crowd. Why? Because it's retail. Why sell wholesale? Sell retail. Go out. Get your name out there. It's a great test to see what you have is a good idea. Well received. You get the crowd to become your advocate. Your ambassador, it's a great thing. So, you know, I'm looking at the site. I see MedX, you know, the green technologies, uh, leader in green technologies, and they raised $4.3 million, 2,000 investors. The minimum invest was $420. What made them successful on the platform to raise that amount well, of money? The C, you know, I'm not going to comment about individual raises because they're still live, they're publicly being mm -hmm. shown. But what I will tell you this. The, the CEO, literally, let's talk clearly, the CEO is engaged, willing to go out, tell the story, has an exciting story, good prospects. That's what it takes to raise money. Now, typically, you would meet, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 VCs, maybe 100 investors, and maybe 10% of them will make you an offer, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Well, here... All that effort, hundreds of hours, you're putting the hundred of hours to find customers. That's not such a bad thing. So I bet a lot of companies on our platform, their sales go up when they're raising money from the consumer. So how does that work? Tell, talk to me about that customer. So are people actually, when they invest, they're getting a product also, as well as investment? Yeah. There's a thing called perks. Yeah. People love perks. Sometimes I feel that they rather have the perk than the shares. Which is kind it's of, like Sports Illustrated, well, right? You buy the subscription just to get that football phone. You don't care about the subscription, right? So, probably. Yeah. That's really true. I, but it shows you how exciting it is, how excited they are about the company because if they rather have the perk than the shares, they love the company. So we're finding a lot of people are interested in the perk and the ability to get some more than just the shares. Sometimes it's an it's an invitation to meet the team. Sometimes it's product discounts on products. It's all over the place. Yeah. So the way they could they, they can be more successful the campaigns is obviously just go above and beyond in the perks, and that will you know allow them to raise more money. If the perks are exciting, the the raise goes way 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 better. 
I mean, we, we see it all the time. So what's next for Start Engine? What should what else should so, people know about it? So the big big news this year is that we're going to be eventually once we get the right uh, registration rights, the license and all that, we're going to launch a secondary marketplace, which is like a mini stock exchange, where our investors, once the shares are are, are freely tradable, which is usually one year after they invest, they can trade. Can you imagine? Mm. What an incredible idea. Look, it's interesting. When you look at the stock market, you know, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, there are 4,700 companies. How many new companies a year come out? 100, a couple hundred. By the time they come out, they're already like big and full of value. Value creation has been really pretty done for a large portion of it. Nothing else. So it's basically everybody, the whole Wall Street is talking about 4,700 companies all day long. Think about all the hedge funds, think about all the traders. It's weird. And you have 5 million companies in this country, 5 million, and dormant, nothing going on. Well, you know what? We're going to change that. We're going to completely change that. We're going to allow companies to issue shares to the, to the consumer and trade. Done. Let's just go. This is going to change how people view investment. What what motivates you, Howard, just to keep pounding and working when, you know, you had two previous successful companies and you probably didn't need to work again and then you go pounding the pavement again? Well, look, I, first of all, don't believe in being inert. I believe in being productive, you know, productive citizens. I, I think we have a responsibility as Americans to help our country become better, grow, you know, have progress. I mean, I think we all have that responsibility. At least I believe it. Maybe some people don't care. I do. But the reality is that my mission. Here's my mission. My mission is to help entrepreneurs achieve their dreams. Well, you know what? That that keeps me going. Why? Because I talk to them all the time. And when they do well on our platform and they are happy and they're able to tell me all the crazy things they're going to do, wow, I'm impressed. So I think, I look at it and say, look, I was lucky. Yeah, I was lucky. But you know what? I worked really hard, and I got lucky. Well, you know what? I want other people to have the same thing. Yeah. I always ask as a last question, uh, Howard, since it's Inspired Insider, I always like to, to know what has been a low moment or big challenge you had to go over, you know, push through and then what was what's been a proud moment for you what's been a big the, challenge low moment I, i've had many low moments and, and that's normal because when you expose yourself to business there are plenty of them i've had a low moment when i started my first business in college i had no more money i had to go to an on to the unemployment line hmm. and collect an unemployment check that's pretty you know demoralizing you have to do it you have to pay the rent but you know what really uh, a young person who has a lot of potential. Well, I had no choice because I chose entrepreneurship and there's no paycheck for a long time, you know? That was a low moment. A high moment, you know, I think the high moment is when I was able to start selling my Activision shares and said, wow, I could buy a house. That's a great thing, you know? Um, so the biggest moment really right now for me has been this. When I realized that the financial industry was really not doing the right thing for people because they, their interest is, is returns on capital. That doesn't mean they're right. That, that, that's what they want, which is fine. I believe in the same thing. But it was just one person saying yes or no. And it, uh, it's, you know, the entrepreneur behind the, be on the other side of the table that gets the no because it's a woman. And she gets two percent of venture capital money. I think it's like, wow, this is like, this is just not right. I get it why they do it because they have proof that men make more money. I get it, but you know what? That doesn't feel right because, first of all, some of my best investments are women. So you know what? Guess what? Let's change it. When you see something you don't like, right? Change it. Now I got lucky. The new law came in, allowed me to do it. So I, I couldn't do it without the Jobs Act. Just, just forget about it. It's not going to happen. But you know what? When I saw, I saw the chance. I saw it happening. And I said, you know what? This is it. We're going to do it. 
And, and a lot of people would say, no, 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 Howard, you're wrong. Here's why. People will never invest online. You don't get it. People are not going to put money with their credit card to buy shares online. They'll never do that. Okay. Number two, entrepreneurs don't want consumers to invest in their company. They want VCs. Okay. That's number two. Or no, the banks will lend them. I mean, all this fallacy, all this falsehood, these myths that people have this belief system is so bizarre. And I said, you know what? You guys are wrong. <laughs> and then you know you have something because you're the people you you know well who are advising you against doing this tells you that you found something special. Howard, I want to be the first one to thank you. Uh, fantastic. Everyone should check out startengine.com. I have a number of people, as soon as we get off this, they need to know about this because I think really is what it is, is getting the message out there and just having more people know that they can use this as a resource. So thank you so much. Welcome. I yeah. really enjoyed it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.